Hi students and welcome to our second lecture um, in our creative writing course. Today we're going to be talking about the power of words. Just as a recap, last time we talked about conveying ideas with words and we looked at things like voice, tone or mood, imagery, organization, and how all of those enhance the meaning. Well today we're going to be looking at something different. We're going to be looking at the power of words. Mark Twain said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. And we're going to prove him right. We're going to see exactly how word choices um, convey that meaning and provide a very powerful image and enhance the meaning of the poem. So today we're going to look at sounds, repetition, rhyme, and meter. Now I want you to understand that this is not just something for poetry. Good writers understand how sounds go together. They understand ideas, repeating um, sounds, repeating ideas. They understand how words flow together. And I'll tell you what, you can really tell who a good writer is because they change up the flow of their writing. They, they use meter to their advantage. When their, their work ends, it sounds natural. Um, so this isn't just something for poetry. This is something for you know narrative essays, uh, critical ess essays, short stories, fiction, nonfiction, you name it. Understanding this concept is really important. We're going to begin by looking at a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Eagle. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. We begin by looking at the sound of words and how sounds convey meaning. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. That tough C sound, that hard C sound, gives it the impression of a very rugged animal. We're not dealing with an animal that is floating or soaring through the air. We're dealing with an eagle and we're seeing him uh, clench on to the mountaintop. So he clasps the crag with crooked hands. A very effective way to use sound, especially onomatopoeia, um, to your advantage. The next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the rhyming scheme. You'll notice that the first three lines rhyme, and then the next three lines rhyme. Each type of poem has a different type of rhyming scheme, and you'll get a chance to play around with a lot of different ones. But this creates two triplets. And in a sense, uh, the rhyming scheme also ties things together. So hands, land, stands, crawls, walls, falls. And these are sort of like two different scenes. Um, the trick is, though, is making your writing flow between one scene and another. And how do we tie together certain scenes? Well, obviously the eagle itself uh, ties this together. It ties um, just everything in this is about the eagle, but we do see two distinct scenes. Well, poetry isn't just about rhyming. It's more than that. It's about using words to convey ideas and connect ideas. So I want you to see this. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. That C sound, along with close and crawls is what we call alliteration. It is the repetition of initial consonant sounds. We also see this with lonely lands. So you have the k sound, cr clasp, crag, crooked, close, crawls, lonely lands. Poetry isn't just about the the words that end the line. There also a lot it has a lot to do with the words inside the lines as well. We also see alliteration with the w sound in world, watches, and walls. So that's alliteration. Another thing that you will see oftentimes and that you can use to your advantage is what's called assonance. And that is when there's a, a repetition of a vowel sound. In this case, we see it in the first line of the second stanza. C beneath, that E sound um, ties these words together. So poetry, again, I can't, I can't stress this enough, is much more than just making um, words rhyme. It's using sounds 
to convey meaning and tie thoughts together. The other thing that I want you to see is I want you to see the meter. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. It sounds a lot like da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. And that is called iambic. It's alternating between unstressed and stressed syllables. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. If we were to write this out, it'd be the wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. And if you ever get stuck on wondering where the stress is, a good rule of thumb is to stick your hand under your chin as you read it. When your chin moves down, that generally is the stress, the wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. So you can gain an understanding for the stress. So, you, so an iambic um, alternates between the unstressed and then the stressed um, syllable. Because there are four iams in this, this is called a quadrameter, four sets of iams. So you have the, the, the dum, that's one set, and because that repeats four times, that's eight syllables per line, so it's called quadramic, iambic quadrameter. The tricky part is when you get to words where there's multiple syllables and you have to make some choices. For example, Renid with the azure world, he stands. And that line sort of breaks up the da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. It breaks up the flow. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. There's a three syllable word. And he puts it right in uh, a spot where it fits and still um, flows with the piece. Again, all of these. All of these techniques, sounds, rhymes, meter, repetition, all of these things add to the poem. And in this case, it's a very simple poem about an eagle. Um, but you see, we'll, you'll see how these techniques can happen when it becomes a more complicated poem and how these really cause uh, us to understand and enhance the meaning of the poem. So let's just do that. We'll look at Holy Sonnet. Batter My Heart Three-Person God by John Donne. Batter my heart three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me and bend, your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but owe oh, to no end, reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captived, and proves weak or untrue. Yet, dearly, I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie, or break that knot again. Take me to you. Imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free. Nor I ever chaste, except you ravish me. This is a poem by John Donne, who uh, was a Christian man, and we see the meaning right away, and it's pretty much found this last, um, this last three lines. Take me to you and prison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. I mean, these are pretty strong words. It's this idea that he's a Christian, he wants to live for God, but he really struggles to live for God. He, he's struggling with living for Satan or um, fulfilling his carnal flesh or whatever, however you want to look at it. And the way that he sees it, he sees it, that God has to take him by force. He really wants God to take control of him. And look at this last, you know, I'm not, except you enthrall me, never shall be free. Okay, you have to imprison me for me to be free, nor ever chaste except you ravish me. I'm not going to be pure unless you rape me. I mean, these are really strong ideas that John Donne is showing us here. And we're going to see how things like sound, meter, rhyme, all of these things enhance that meaning that he's saying here. The first thing I want you to look at is that there are three parts of this poem. The first stanza kind of deals with this imagery of flagellation, and that's sort of what uh, monks would do. They would beat themselves up, and, and that was, uh, in a way, teaching them to sacrifice. You have this imagery of a captive town, right? He says, um, I, I'm like this conquered town, 
And I want you to come and, 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 and wake me up and, and free me, right? And then you have this imagery of lovers and marriage where he talks about being betrothed to an enemy and he wants to be divorced. So you have these three ideas. So how are we going to tie these ideas together? How are we going to make it flow? I mean, obviously, you make it flow by the voice, by the words that you use, by the overall meaning, but also the techniques in poetry, the techniques in sounds and rhymes will help us to tie these together, and we'll see just that. The first thing that we can look at is we can look at the rhyming scheme. We see that the first uh, line and the last line of the stanza rhyme and the middle lines rhyme as well. The line repeats in stanza two, so the the rhyme, the A, B, B, A, is also going to repeat A, B, B, A. And then in stanza three, it changes. So we have an introduction of a new word, feign, a new rhyme scheme that's going to be used feign and again. And then we have enemy, free me, okay? And then I is thrown in there as well. So our rhyme scheme is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, E, D, D. Now, the other thing I want you to notice, though, is look at the last line of the first, uh, the last word of the first line in stanza one, and look at the last word of the last stanza, the last line, you and me. So here he has A and D, right? They don't rhyme, but you and me go together. So again, once again, I can't stress enough, poetry and writing is much more than making words rhyme. It's about tying together these thoughts and using words very judiciously. I want you to notice something else here. Notice the alliteration of the B sound. And remember, alliteration is that consonant sound, the repetition of a consonant sound. Batter, breathe, bend, break, blow, burn, betrothed, break. So again, this is tying these, by using this sound, it's tying these, th these, these thoughts together. It's bringing a cohesiveness to this poem. Notice the repetition of the word break there in the last line of the first stanza and in the third line of the third stanza. Notice the assonance of the O sound. So we have God and knock, right? That's, a, that's the ah sound. But then we have overthrow, oh, no. So again, by using these sounds, we're bringing together, we're tying this poem together. This is being poetic. This is using more than just rhyme. Now I want you to look at this last line. Nor ever chased except you ravish me, because we're going to talk about meter. We saw that in The Eagle by Alfred Lord Tennyson, we saw it was iambic quadrameter. In this case, it's a sonnet. And a sonnet goes like this. To dum, to dum, to dum, to dum, to dum. So you might notice it's added an extra iamb. And we call that iambic pentameter. It's five iams. That's where we get that pentameter. It's also ten syllables. Now there's something else about this poem. It's a little irregular. And there are some irregularities in the meter, specifically in the first line. Take a look at this. Batter my heart. Now I suppose we could say batter my heart, three person, but it's really batter my heart. So it reads like dumb da da dum da dum da dum da dum That's an irregularity. But that irregularity is on purpose. Remember, this is a tough poem. This is a poem that's like, beat me up, God, make me yours. I'm not going to be free unless you shake me and unless you take me, right? So that, that adds to it. That adds to the tension of the poem. By adding that irregularity, he's adding that tension. Batter my heart, three-person God. It's really quite brilliant. And if you're a guy like John Donne, you can get away with it. I want you to notice something else, though. Notice the abrupt changes in meter in lines two and four in the first stanza. So you have this da dum da dum da dum da dum or dum 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 da da dum da dum da dum da dum right. But then he goes, so batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet, but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend. You're forced to break, 
blow, burn, and make me new. So you hear that, you hear that abruptness, the dun 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 dun, dun right? That, again, that adds to the meaning, that it's adding to this, you've got to shake me, God. So in, in this beautiful poetic flow of iambic pentameter, we have this jerkiness that still goes with the meter. It's singu it's um, monosyllabic, but it's it's causing a jerkiness to it, and it's adding to the meaning of the poem, of this jerkiness in life that John Donne desperately desires. Notice also, this is a neat technique of continuing thought beyond the end of the line. So just because the line ends and the word is supposed to rhyme with the next line, doesn't mean you have to end the thought. And this is really an, a, a wonderful effect, effect that, um, a wonderful effective technique that you can use. So, batter my heart, three person God, for you as yet but not breathe, shine and seek to men. It kind of keeps that thought going, it moves it along, right? So it moves it along right into the jerkiness. And he does it again in line three that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. You see how he does that? It's really brilliant. And all of these things um, add to the meaning of this poem. So again, this is a way of um, using more than just simple rhymes at the end of lines. This is a way of tying everything together to take hold of what you're trying to to say what is the meaning of your poem and how are you going to say it to affect that meaning, to bring about that meaning. So your assignment is you're going to analyze how sounds, rhymes, repetition, and meter enhance meaning. And so you're going to look at a sonnet that I wrote, sonnet number 17, and a poem called I Rise by Maya Angelou, and you will be doing the same activity here. Again, as you're doing this activity, Think about how the writer is being intentional in everything they do and how that affects the meaning because this is exactly what you're going to be doing, not only in your poetry assignments, but also in your short story and more free form writing as well.